she made you feel like she was in the kitchen with you. When people receive the things that they need, they grow physically, spiritually, emotionally. I completely support what he's doing. It means the world to me. Today on Spotlight, we are celebrating Thanksgiving with sports, like how SLU's football team helped change the game. Plus, a story about food. Imagine growing fresh veggies and herbs in and out of season. And then Thanksgiving Day can be one of the busiest days in the ER. Find out why. But first, giving back and helping connect kids with sports, even if they can't afford the equipment. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Put a few Facebook posts out. We started something that was very small and it turned into something very beautiful. St. Louis Sports Outreach is a nonprofit located in Overland, Missouri that is dedicated to making sure all kids have an opportunity to play sports. We're an organization set up to make sure any kid that wants to play a sport is not denied that due to high cost of equipment. So if a kid needs a bat, needs a glove, needs paracletes or anything, you know, they can get a hold of us, we'll help them out. Oh, I love it. It's something I wish would have been around when I was younger, so I completely support what he's doing. Um, my daughter wouldn't have been able to play sports without it, so it means the world to me. <laughs> I think more kids need to be in sports for sure and I think that um, you know helping kids that maybe need help getting the things that they need to be in those sports is, is a really good thing for him to do. It's, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Every child should be able to play a game. I mean, every kid. It gets them out of the house. It gets them off the video games. You know, it teaches them, it teaches them humility, you know. I mean, everybody needs a dose of humility and these kids get out there and they have fun. They, they play non-stop. Sports Outreach doesn't charge for their equipment. They also accept trade-ins, letting parents replace outgrown equipment with new sizes. Donations are welcome, with the money going to buy new equipment for the kids and to fund two scholarships for local high school students. We have two fundraisers a year. We'll have a rock and roll bingo, and then in December we have our annual pool tournament, which you know around these parts has honestly become pretty legendary. STL. YSO seeks to ease the burden on struggling families whose children wish to play organized sports. That's nice. This helps promote an active and healthy lifestyle for all of our children. The organization caught the attention of TV host Mike Rowe. He featured St. Louis Sports Outreach on his Facebook watch show, Returning the Favor. And then when Mike Rowe walked in a room, I was, they got me fair and square. It was pretty, uh, it was fun. It was like a whirlwind those two or three days. It was fun. You know, down to Bush Stadium with them hanging out, the talks. You know, they donated um, about $30,000 in equipment. They gave us $10,000 in cash. We put that all in a trust for our college scholarship. So it was definitely an experience, once in a lifetime experience for sure. Sports Outreach provides more than sporting equipment. They also help out in the community, holding toy and diaper drives and buying presents for sick kids around the holidays. We love it. I just try to make everybody aware of what he's doing and get as much support behind him as we can. To see the smile on her faces, it makes it all worthwhile. Thank you, thank you guys. See you guys. Good night. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hello, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell, president of the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis, and this is History Spotlight. Football gained popularity in the late 19th century, but it was a much different game than the one we know today. Public historian Adam Claffey explains how the 1906 St. Louis University football team played a role in this change. For millions of Americans, every weekend between September and January is about football. But all those people kind of owe a debt of gratitude to a team from St. Louis from the early 20th century that really helped change the way that football is played in America today. So let's back up a little bit. 
Football starts gaining popularity in the United States in the late 19th century, but it's a much different game than what people today would be expecting. One of the biggest differences is that the only way to advance the ball down the field back then was to run the ball past the line of scrimmage, meaning a running back would take the ball and move it past the line of scrimmage to try to advance the ball downfield. And what that led to was huge scrums of defensive players around that ball carrier trying to take him down. And those scrums could end up being pretty violent. You know, people would be trying to rip the ball away and twist the guy's fingers to get the ball out and everything. And it led to a lot of injuries. But those injuries are more than twisted ankles and stuff. You know, people broke their neck, they broke their back. In 1905 alone, 18 people died playing football in America. It was becoming a huge problem. And there was activists who were advocating that football should be banned because of the violence of the sport. And of course, there were other people that wanted to try to save football, to find a way to change it, to make it a little bit safer. One of those people who supported keeping football around was the president at the time, Teddy Roosevelt. And in 1905, he calls for a conference at the White House from leading football coaches and strategists and people involved in the game to try to come up with some rule changes that could help save football, preserve it into the future. And one of the rule changes they walk away with is to allow for the forward pass in football, where a quarterback can take the ball and throw it past the line of scrimmage to an eligible receiver downfield to try to gain yardage. And the hope was that this would spread out defenses a little bit, right? So you wouldn't have scrums of people around the line of scrimmage, they'd have to cover eligible receivers. But a lot of critics thought this isn't going to work at all, that defenders would just bump receivers off their paths, that quarterbacks won't be accurate enough. It just wouldn't be an effective way to run an offense of football. That all changes in September of 1906. That year, in a game on September 5th, St. Louis University quarterback Bradbury Robinson completes the first forward pass in football history. He throws a 20-yard touchdown pass to an eligible receiver named Jack Schneider. And this is not the only forward pass that SLU throws that year. Their entire offense is built around this fast aerial attack. And they're a really good team. They go undefeated in that 1906 season. And even before the season is over, other coaches from around the country are contacting SLU coach Eddie Kokums to try to get some tips from him about how to implement the forward pass into their game. And it completely changes the way that football is played in America today. So for all those millions of people that watch football every weekend in the United States, they kind of owe a debt of gratitude to the St. Louis University team in 1906 that showed just how effective the forward pass could be. Next on History Spotlight, a court case that sent shockwaves through the country. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Under the roof of this food distribution warehouse, something out of the ordinary is happening. We have about 150 heads of leaf lettuce growing, green leaf lettuce. This hydroponics farm can be used indoors and in any season. So we can grow lettuce in winter. Normally you wouldn't be able to get lettuce unless you have some sort of a greenhouse, but now we can get lettuce any time of the year. Operation Food Search, a nonprofit hunger relief organization, is the first food bank in St. Louis to receive the Flex Farms. These indoor systems were a donation from United Healthcare Community Plan and Fork Farms. We were started as a rescue food bank in 1981 by some local concerned residents who knew there were people who didn't have access to healthy food. Since then, the organization has evolved with more than $35 million worth of food going out into the St. Louis region each year. Um, that translates into more than 200,000 people receiving food through our organization's partners each month here in the region. The flex farms are named Demeter and Cirrus after the Greek and Roman goddesses of agriculture. They can yield 25 pounds of produce per month. One farm can serve nearly 2,000 families per year with a harvest of 3,400 plants. Umberger says the flex farms don't use any pesticides or herbicides. They're energy efficient and easy to maintain. <laughs> Operation Food Search primarily serves low-income families. 
Health officials say it's important for all families to have access to fresh vegetables all year long. Families that do not have adequate access to fresh vegetables are considered food insecure. And officials say fresh vegetables are vital to healthy eating and key to combating chronic disease, such as high blood pressure and diabetes. In addition to the Flex Farms, Operation Food Search designed programs dedicated to addressing the importance of a healthy diet. We have Fresh Rx Nourishing Healthy Starts and then Fresh Rx Prescribing Healthy Futures. So Fresh Rx Nourishing Healthy Starts works with pregnant women up through 60 days postpartum that are experiencing food insecurity. And so it's a food as medicine program that provides a weekly meal kit to the program participant and anyone else in their household. And we also have the Prescribing Healthy Futures program, which serves children with diabetes and their families. Working with kids with diabetes is in response to a disproportionately high rate of uh, pediatric diabetes, particularly in low income areas. So they're doing the majority of their food shopping at corner stores or gas stations that don't have access to fresh produce and vegetables and all of that. Their only food option comes from packaged food and that processed food. They're not getting those nutrients they need. Eventually that can lead to earlier and earlier onsets of diabetes and obesity kind of all as a symptom of that food insecurity. Other factors such as lack of access to nutritious, affordable food and transportation have an enormous impact on a person's health. Operation Food Search says it is committed to providing nutrition and health information to the community. We have a responsibility to not only meet that immediate need for families right now, but also to look to the future and how can we make the future better. Every organization that works with families needs to be a part of thinking long term about how we get to a point where food banks are only needed when people have some sort of crisis that they're going through, that it doesn't become an intergenerational coping strategy just to survive. But for now, Operation Food Search focuses on the daily nutritional needs of families who are suffering from food insecurity. I think that this opportunity to have greens grown in-house gives us an opportunity to connect with our families in a way that they know where the food is coming from and they know how it's getting to them. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. While everyone has their own Thanksgiving Day traditions, hopefully a trip to the emergency room isn't one of them. The holidays definitely bring in more patients into emergency rooms and urgent cares. And Thanksgiving Day can be one of the busiest days for emergency rooms. But Mercy nurse practitioner Jerry Power says not everyone needs to go to the ER. The doors of urgent cares are open and waiting for the accidents and other urgent medical needs that happen on the day that families gather, cook turkey, eat, drink, and play. Uh, certainly as people get together and there's more cooking, there's more cooking related injuries. Uh, so even minor cuts, minor burns are things that we'll see increased frequency of in an urgent care setting. The top reasons why people suddenly end up in the emergency rooms and urgent cares on Thanksgiving Start with turkey troubles. There's certainly the risk, just even minor burns, but the frying of a turkey uh, out in front of the garage, and those can, of course, be dangerous. Uh, you'll hear many a story of a firefighter who has responded to a house fire started by uh, too much oil when the turkey gets dumped in there. It's not just the turkey cooking, it's the carving catastrophes too. But don't always blame the turkey. <laughs> A lot of it just comes with cooking the, the sides, right? You're, you're cutting potatoes for the mashed potatoes. So we'll see people who are maybe not wielding knives all, as frequently as they do during the holidays. And so suddenly everyone becomes a gourmet chef. And, and so they're going to cut themselves. We see injuries with mandolins, uh, which are those uh, devices which we slice uh, thin vegetables with. And, and people forget how dangerous those things could be. And, and suddenly we're getting all manner of cuts and slices and things like that uh, arriving at our urgent cares. And for the people who don't really cook all year and are suddenly in the kitchen, some advice to help keep your family safe and away from here. Preparing of the turkey, there is always a concern for increase of like GI issues uh, related to salmonella. So just proper cooking and proper food handling techniques. Even if the meal is perfectly safe, 
Overindulgence is also a big reason for a trip to the urgent care or ER. Any type of overeating for even the healthiest person is going to cause some problems. And so that can be everything from just indigestion and upset stomach to uh, things like, you know, uh, the GI issues such as diarrhea or constipation. Uh, for those populations of people who have diabetes, perhaps eating too many sugars, that's certainly something we see a lot of in the holidays. With those folks who are, are diabetic or have congestive heart failure, the intake of salt is just increased tremendously because uh, we use a lot of salt in our food over the holidays. So uh, with that comes uh, just an increased chance of, of health-related illness. And if that's not enough pressure, which is plenty, there's the in-law or family stress. With the holidays and people getting together, yeah, it's, it's just a, a ripe scenario for, you know, bad interactions, some family struggles and drama can create a lot of stress that, uh, that adds to things that can complicate your health. So even people who have heart conditions are just more prone to having cardiac events in the context of stress. And adding to it, there's the accidents from being active. Maybe a game of football in the yard. The urgent cares are prepared to address minor to moderate injuries, uh, sports injuries. With anything that happens, if the degree of a medical emergency is not obviously an emergency room visit, how do you know when it's best to go to the ER or urgent care? I think if you are really concerned, then you, you should seek that higher level of care. You always have the opportunity to call either your primary care, or if you don't have primary care, you can even call one of the Mercy Go Health Urgent Cares and talk to one of the clinicians, and they can kind of direct you in a way to go. Building beds for a better future, later on Spotlight. Finding a recipe these days is fast and easy. Just hop online and search. But the authors of the ninth edition of Joy of Cooking will tell you their recipes are tried and true. Just think of it as a very heavily curated and fact-checked internet. John Becker yes. should know he's the great-grandson <laughs> of really Irma Rombauer, the St. Louis woman who authored and self-published the first edition in 1931. Nearly 60 years later in 2019, Becker and his wife Megan Scott published the latest edition, adding 600 new recipes after several years of testing. It was the first cookbook that I ever uh, bought for myself, but I picked it up because I, I knew it had a reputation for having everything that you would need to know as a cook. Joy of Cooking has raised a nation of home cooks, over 20 million of us. But when the cookbook made its debut, it was at a time in American history when finding joy was as scarce as finding a job. In the early 1930s, Americans were in the throes of the Great Depression with no work people lined up outside soup kitchens and families struggled to put food on the table. In 1931, at 52 years of age, St. Louis socialite Irma Rombauer was no different. She found herself with no income and little savings after her husband, Edgar, a prominent attorney, took his own life the year before. Biographer Ann Mendelssohn writes in Standing Facing the Stove that Rombauer was strong-willed, intelligent, forthright, and artistic. Born to German immigrants in 1877, Rombauer spent most of her life in St. Louis, aside from a few years overseas when her father, Dr. Maximilian von Starkloff, served as a diplomat. Their home still stands at Compton and Longfellow. Mendelssohn also writes that Rombauer is known for being an engaging hostess and was president of the Wednesday Club, a St. Louis social club for women who wanted to gain knowledge and take part in civic projects. Inspired by a successful cookbook published to support a St. Louis children's home and at the urging of her two grown children, Marion and Edgar, Brambauer went to work writing her own version, despite her lack of cooking experience. Irma grew up with household servants and she had a cook. And so she, when she found herself in reduced circumstances after her husband's death, I think a lot of it was due to she was kind of approaching the kitchen anew and learning a, not a lot of new things for herself as well. She gathered recipes from church friends, pals at the Wednesday Club, and her family, testing them all and adding witty comments on not only how to prepare the food, but how to serve it. This is something great to have like on hand, you know, in case, you know, your neighbor stops by. So it's a lot of that sort of, that you can definitely see that hostess and kind of entertaining background. The result was The Joy of Cooking, a compilation of reliable recipes with a casual culinary chat. It's the family miracle, for real. I'm, for, yes. That's pretty much how we feel about it. 
Her daughter Marion illustrated the cover, a simple drawing of St. Martha, the patron saint of cooking who wielded a mop to fight off the dragon Tarasque. Five years after her first edition, Rombauer found a publisher, Bob's Merrill. Together, they introduced Joy of Cooking to the world. Yeah, that's a really remarkable thing to me, is that she kind of embarked on this career in her midlife. And she had no prior experience as a writer, and she seemed to embrace it with a sense of humor. And I think that's what came across in that early edition especially. And what really endeared her to so many readers is that she really was just a personable individual, and she made you feel like she was in the kitchen with you. Bonjour! <laughs> My friends. This is Irma Rombauer. But one of Rombauer's Joy. biggest fans was Julia Child. The first edition of The Joy of Cooking took me a year to write. Oh. Their relationship was briefly depicted in the Nora Ephron movie, Julie and Julia, of which the family is not a fan. Let's just say that there was something lost in that, that uh, treatment of Irma. Uh, you know, for instance, I don't think that Irma would have been so forthcoming with her husband's suicide. From Irma to her daughter Marion to her son Ethan Becker and from Ethan to his son John and wife Megan, there's been a new addition roughly every decade. We don't want Joy to just become a museum piece. We don't want it to be irrelevant. We want it to continue to be a helpful cookbook for home cooks. So we tried very much to stay in that spirit when we were revising it. The 1943 edition gave space for wartime rationing. In 1951, new appliances like blenders and freezers came into the picture and into the book. So this one is the 1975 edition. So this is the one that sold over 6 million copies, so the most popular one. Magdalene Link is a researcher at the Missouri Historical Library. She says since so few copies were printed in 1931, that first edition is tough to find. Is it rare to find signed copies of The Joy of Cooking by Irma Rombauer? We do have two first editions, so one first edition has the original dust jacket on it, and that one is signed by Irma Rombauer, and it's dedicated to Maisie, and Maisie was her husband's secretary, and Maisie helped her with um, kind of writing early editions of the book um, and kind of developing some of those early recipes. We also have a first edition that's signed by her daughter, Marion, who did the illustrations, um, and she was the head of, I believe, the art department at John Burroughs school at the time. Irma Rombauer died in St. Louis in 1962. Her tomb at Bell Fountain Cemetery is often visited by fans. She is memorialized with a star along St. Louis's Walk of Fame in the Del Mar Loop, which Becker and Scott visited in 2011. Irma is such an illustrious presence and I think she deserves the star, absolutely, and it was really cool to see. But yeah, it is humbling to, it's humbling to think that we're responsible for her legacy in some ways, that that is, we take that to heart. Becker and Scott are already making plans for Joy's 100th anniversary edition in 2031. For now, follow along in their kitchen on Instagram at the official Joy of Cooking. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. This is what's known as Build Day. Eight years ago, Steve McLean heard about a unique volunteer opportunity where he could put his woodworking skills to good use. Sleep in Heavenly Peace is an organization that makes uh, beds for kids, simply put. But there was a problem. The nearest chapter was in Kansas City. And I thought, gosh darn it, why aren't there somebody here in St. Louis with a chapter, and as soon as I said that, I thought, uh, actually, why don't I build, <laughs> start a chapter here in St. Louis? He enlisted the help of fellow members at Arlington United Methodist Church in Bridgeton. The need in the St. Louis region is great. Roughly 26,000 children do not have beds. We just cannot understand the effect that having a bed can be for someone in, a, in their rest, in their psych, you know, psychology, any of those things. They develop better when they have basic comforts, basic needs met. And so we have communities where people, they don't have beds. Children do not have beds. We get to tangibly give them these things. We get to be a part of that. I really enjoy it. Volunteer Terry Lasico has been part of several builds. It's a good thing for me to get out and feel like I'm participating in something important for my community. 
The best part, she says, is delivering the beds. I admire the fact that people are out there struggling to do everything they can to make things work and have the bravery to call them and say, I need a hand. So if I could be the hand, I want to be the hand. And on a cool, crisp fall afternoon, a connection as volunteers arrive at this North County home. I was so happy. I was so excited. Hannah Jones called Sleep in Heavenly Peace asking for bunk beds for her older children, ages 11, 7, and 4-year-old twins. The kids had all been sleeping together on a mattress on the floor. They stayed up later because they're fighting because one that they touching each other, which made them be cranky in the mornings. Volunteers came in and put the bunks together. The new beds included new mattresses, sheets, pillows, and comforters for the little ones. Hannah surprised her children later that day and shared video of their excitement. Do you like that bed? But thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody, to the organization, to the volunteers for coming to put the beds together, for helping me help them. We appreciate it. It's the smiling faces of both parents and children that keep volunteers motivated. Between the Alton and St. Louis chapters, hundreds of children have new beds. Both groups recently took part in Bunks Across America, a national drive to build more than 5,000 new beds. We do not require any experience. Organizers say any adult and older child can volunteer. On this day, volunteers from the Way Church in Wentzville helped with the build. One of the nice things about the way they set up the builds is they break it down into very simple tasks. We can show you what you need to do in about five minutes, and the experience level goes from people that actually do construction and, and woodworking down to people who've never picked up a drill before. Companies, churches, and other groups can sponsor a build and provide volunteers as well. Right now there's a waiting list of about 50 beds. We have delivered to kids that don't even know what a bed is. We were hauling stuff into their homes and they thought they were gonna get a mattress to lay on the floor. That was to them what bed was. They had no idea what the wood was for, what all the pillows and all that, they didn't know. And so the excitement that you see on their faces and the relief you see on the parents' faces is, um, is very rewarding and, and that's really why we do this is for the kids. When people receive the things that they need, they grow. They grow physically, spiritually, emotionally, everything. It's just, it's better. And so being able to do something like this, this tangible act of, hey, here, um, it just helps exponentially in ways that I think we don't even find out until later when these, when these young children have grown. Next week, a local student competes in a worldwide programming competition just for girls. Plus, an artist's new album shares an uplifting message for today's world. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.